I did not do the countdown. We are immediately nope. live. No fancy countdown. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Space Club. Uh, we're a monthly space exploration live stream. Uh, we're three former university colleagues who are now spread around the world. Uh, but each month we get together, uh, just like we used to on campus weekly, uh, to talk about space exploration. So uh, we typically go about an hour. Uh, but tonight we might push it to about 75 minutes as we have a lot of catching up to do uh, from a summer off. I guess that was one of the other things I wanted to mention in our pre-show chat, Tanya and Phil, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that the number of slides yeah. denotes that we may run uh, a bit longer than the 60 minutes, but certainly not uh, beyond 90, which is our absolute maximum mm -hmm. total. Yeah, this is the first we're hearing about this. So you're yeah, well, working free labor here. I mean, come on, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I did all the work. Except for all of Phil's knowledge, which I made one slide. That's true. You did. <laughs> um, um, so as always, uh, you can watch the old episodes on, on Tanya's YouTube channel and uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. So my name is Danny Bednar. I'm a part time assistant professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. And uh, I, that's where I teach about geography of space exploration. Um, joining me as usual is Dr. Professor, creator of worlds and president of the Mapping Irregular Planetary Objects Fan Club, Mr. Phil Stuke, Professor Emeritus at Western University. And of course, our resident Martian expert uh, and president of the DAX from Deep Space Nine turned me by fan club, Dr. Tanya Harrison, our Martian science expert. Um, Tanya, I'll start with you. How was your summer? I know you went to the Space Coast, but we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, any other news from Tanya Land? Oh my gosh. Uh, it went by too quickly, which I'm sure is the same thing everybody has to say about every summer. I'm trying to think of anything else exciting happened. <laughs> uh, I mean, lots did, but I feel like I can't remember yeah. anything because I'm so exhausted. <laughs> well, and it might be like your last week was expensive exceptionally exciting so maybe that is like blocked out everything that happened before that's true i'm so excited about everything that we're going to talk about from last week that like nothing else was cool enough to level up to that level of like embedding in my memory yeah that's fair um phil i hope you're doing well out on uh, vancouver island which i learned this week um was it only joined i mean i think i have this right it, it, i was enjoying adult beverages whilst learning this, but the Vancouver Island, Vancouver Island only joined BC under the assumption that it would become the rail terminus of Canada, which then Vancouver stole. Um, is that true? Uh, I believe so. That's right. And there were all sorts of plans for how that railway would uh, actually get over to the island. Um, uh, it would have been have to be near the north end of the island where it comes close to the mainland. But that's a very, very mountainous area, very difficult area. So um, I think eventually they did have to scrap that, yeah. But otherwise, how was your summer? Oh, great. I just uh, did the same thing I do every day, try to keep up with what's <laughs> happening in the solar system. <laughs> when you, every time it's you getting harder it. and harder to keep up with what's happening in the solar system. People keep doing stuff. I know. Yeah. Tell me about it. My the course at this point, the course I teach, which is your old course, I used to, and maybe wrongfully so, but I think you were able to do this at a time. I used to pretty much cover every planetary body and almost every mission that went there, but I've given up just because you want to be able to look forward and there's a bunch of new missions you want to cover, and it's just impossible at this point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I have to specialize. Yeah. Um, so speaking of past planetary science missions um this day ish in space ish uh and this month is actually an actual this day in space because this day 14 years from now in the past uh nasa launched the dawn mission uh so dawn was a spacecraft that flew to uh, what you're seeing here in very poor resolution but will, which shortly will become very nice resolution um flew to ceres and ceres is uh, well, it's a very large asteroid that's round in the asteroid belt, but it also gets the moniker of a dwarf planet um, because of its size and roundness. Um, so Dawn was the first mission to this object. Um, and uh, those of you keeping score, that means that this body series is uh, in the same category like 
uh, Pluto and Eris, uh, which are way out in the outer solar system. So what's cool about Ceres is it's a it's a second grade planet, an almost planet that's very close to us. Um, so Tanya, memories from 2007. Do you remember the launch of Dawn, or when did Dawn come on to your radar? I don't think I paid too much attention to it until I started working for the Planetary Society, actually, when I was at Western, um, because mm. I used to post people's blog entries, um, and I would edit them to remove the academies, uh, <laughs> as Emily Lactoalo would put it. Um, and so Mark Raymond, who was the head engineer for the Dawn mission, would write these fantastic updates every single month. He is such an engaging writer. He's a really engaging presenter. If you ever get the chance to see him like at a conference or something, yeah. um, mm -hmm. or maybe look for him on YouTube, he always has really great updates. Um, so if you want a, a blast from the past, go to the Planetary Society's blog and look for Mark Raymond's posts. And he he tried to have a really entertaining um, introduction to every single one of them. And by the time the mission had gone on for so many years, he was like, I'm having trouble thinking of new ideas. I have to go back and make sure I'm not reusing one that I used you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, so Phil, I know you paid a close attention to this, this mission. So by the time Dawn got to series, it was 2015, it was eight years later. And that was right in the midst of the OG space club. We were watching this mission uh week to week in space club and you were giving us updates and those those images at the beginning where it was really pixelated and then it got clearer and clearer right. that was each week for us which was really really cool um right. so phil what do you remember from 2015 and 2016 and, and <laughs> well you, uh, yeah never mind 2015 and 2016 for a second you're missing yeah. out something very important about dawn which was that it, went it started out looking at as another asteroid Vesta. Uh, so, in fact, it uh, it it first it explored Vesta, uh, yes. uh, uh, which is about half the diameter of Ceres, but a, a very interesting world in its own right, uh, and one that has provided uh, meteorites that we can pick up on Earth. Um, we are pretty sure that they've come from there, anyway. Uh, so it explored that uh, for a couple of years or so, and then it moved on to Ceres. Um, so really, there were two encounters like that, um, and. Uh, my, I think the thing that was most interesting for me is something that I've enjoyed really all my life is the 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 discovery of a new world. So uh, you know, you start out with those very low resolution images, and uh, and this was a slow moving spacecraft uh, uh, because it's using an iron engine to get into orbit. It has to approach quite slowly, uh, so it takes quite a long time for that tiny little image to grow. Uh, and uh, so every every day or two as new images are released, you're just seeing that little bit more detail and it's very slowly uh, revealed to us. And uh, that reveal of a new world is one of the things that I really enjoy. And I certainly enjoyed that about uh, about this mission. Yeah, so two things. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot Vesta. And I know you love Vesta and Phil might like Vesta. <laughs> if you Google a oh, map of Vesta or what does Vesta look like, there's a good chance uh, Phil's name might pop up, or at least a map made by him. Um, so, so that might explain some of the Vesta love from Phil, right? <laughs> I remember you gave a talk about mapping Vesta in the geography department, and it was standing room only. Like there were people <laughs> around the back, and I was so pleased to see that so many people were excited to learn about Vesta. But I think it was really because you just had a massive fan club at Western, and everybody wanted to come and hear anytime you came to talk about space stuff. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, uh, that, that, that was fun. That, uh, yeah, that talk was about sort of mapping irregularly shaped objects in general, not just Vesta. But uh, we, yeah, we, uh, I always enjoyed talking to those groups. Yeah, and then good. yeah, exactly what you said. These images, if if you ever hear about a mission going somewhere where something's never been, not to knock on all the missions that do go places we already know well, but we had this, and then. It, only a year later, we had the Pluto flyby, and both of those were literally us sitting in Space Club and seeing these images that no one had ever seen. So, like you say, Phil, it's like the revelation of a new world, which yeah. eventually we'll run out of those, at least in this solar system. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in planetary science... Yeah, not in my lifetime, though. <laughs> in our solar system? Well, I mean, they'll also get very boring, like... This is Kuiper Belt object 6000, and it looks just like 599.9. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I know Pluto turned out yeah. to be super cool. So that's, you never know what else is out there. Yeah, that's right. All right, uh, let's get going. Um, another, uh, what is becoming a monthly segment is uh, me assessing Tanya's recent television appearances. Um, but um, these are the clips, Tanya. I edited mostly anything that doesn't have our book in it. But <laughs> this is what you were showing, which was very good. I appreciate that our book is prominent. Um, and I, from what I can tell, you were talking about rockets. Oh, I remember this one. This was, oh gosh, what was the event that was happening for this one? It might have been Branson or Musk. Um, yes, it was one of the the million the billionaire space flights. Because this guy, this was a Turkish news station. Yes. And this its interviewer asked the best questions that I've ever had in a TV interview. And mm -hmm. he actually DM'd me on Twitter afterward, and I I told him this. I because he most people had very. Um, I don't know, kind of basic questions about the idea of the billionaire space race. And he really got into some like deep questions about, you know, what, what does this mean? And is it good or is it bad? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's on YouTube if anybody wants to find it, but um, I was very impressed with this particular guy. So so um, I'll have everyone know I was also asked to be on TV this summer. Um, but I didn't really check my emails for most of August. And then by the time I read it, I assumed it was a scam. So I ignored it. And then by the time I decided to respond, it was too late. And they asked someone else, which is someone we know, Marion, actually. Um, oh, nice. but, uh, yeah, I don't know if any of you guys know anything about glass blowing, but I would have been, um, on a Netflix show, judging some glass blowing competition, doing some space stuff. I don't know anything about glass blowing. Um, next okay, to the GIS space. lab at Western was a glass blowing lab. And I always wondered what yes. the hell they did in there because every time I walked by, they just looked like a bunch of bongs and like, <laughs> they make a uh, fancy, uh, glass, um, beakers and, and, uh, devices, you know, for like uh, all the, uh, in the chemistry department, all this, all the stuff they do, mm. uh, yeah. Distilling things and what have, oh, whatever. there you have it. Um, so let's get to Tanya's exciting news. Uh, two weeks ago, you may have all seen that there are people in outer space. I know, crazy. Um, one of these people in outer space, well, she's back now, is actually a good friend of Tanya's, and I can assume she is a friend of the show. Um, tell us, Tanya, about uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor's visit to space, and what did she bring you back? So uh, you might have heard of the Inspiration4 mission. This is the first all civilian crew to go into space on a SpaceX Dragon rocket. And the mission was sponsored by a guy named Jared Isaacman, who founded Shift4 Payments when he was relatively young. Um, and he decided that he wanted to find a way to have a fundraiser. And so he created this fundraiser for St. Jude um, Children's Cancer Research Center and decided to pick three people to go into space with him to promote fundraisers. So he picked uh, Cyan Proctor, who's a professor at South Mountain Community College in Phoenix. And she also did a sabbatical at Arizona State University um, while I was down there. And I think we met through social media before we met in person and realized that we were basically neighbors. Um, and she's genuinely one of the most amazing humans that I have ever met and one of the, the kindest and most genuine people I've ever met. So they couldn't have picked a better person for like that slot on the crew. And then they had Haley Arsenault, who's the, the girl that's upside down in this view from space. And she's a children's cancer survivor who was treated at St. Jude and then grew up to become a nurse there. Um, and Jared went to St. Jude and asked if they had someone that worked there that would really embody the idea of hope because each crew member represented a different um, quality. So there was prosperity, generosity, hope, and oh gosh, I'm blanking on what the fourth one was. Uh, the fourth one was Jared, <laughs> but probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, St. Jude said, uh, oh, we, we know exactly who we should recommend to you. And they recommended Haley. And so she got a call out of the blue offering her a trip into space. She was not a, a space person before this. She'd never thought about going to space. Uh, and she just fully embraced this and became like this amazing spokesperson for both the mission and for St. Jude. And then 
uh, another guy, Chris Sembrowski, who just entered a contest where I think it was if you donated to St. Jude, they randomly selected somebody out of the, the pool of folks that donated to go into space. And he's an aerospace engineer from Everett, Washington, which is where the, the main Boeing facilities are at. Um, and yeah, they, they went into space. They It wasn't one of these things where they went into a suborbital flight. So there was no argument here over um, terminology. They went fully into orbit for three days, um, did some science while they were up there. Cyan did some art while she was up there, which I think is being auctioned off for St. Jude. Uh, the fundraiser raised, the last time I saw, over $250 million for St. Jude research, which is absolutely right. incredible. Um, and the, the fundraiser is still open, actually. So if anybody is interested in donating, you can go to events.stjude.org slash Tanya of Mars. Um, and any little bit helps. If I think if you donate certain amounts, St. Jude actually sends you a little bit of swag, which is cool. Um, but yeah, so there was a group of us that went down. We got to go out to the launch pad and see the rocket on the pad. So that's the lower left image there. Um, the launch was a dusk launch, so it was absolutely stunning. When the rocket gets to a certain altitude in the air, even though it's dark where you are watching the launch, when it's high enough, the sunlight coming over the horizon actually hits all of the exhaust, and it just lights up like a nebula in the sky, which is the picture on the right. And it's just one of the most stunning things you can ever see because it's like nothing else. And I think that that, I'm sure they planned that. They really wanted a launch that would stick in people's memories because they're making a Netflix documentary series about this. But it was really cool to experience this event with a bunch of non-space people because there are only a handful of folks that were there who were friends of Cyan. The rest were friends and family of the other people on the crew. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't necessarily space fans before this. Most of them had never seen a launch before. And just like hearing and seeing their reactions to everything was really, really cool. Um, and it went without a hitch as far as, as far as we know. It launched on time, landed perfectly in the Atlantic, a little bit off the coast of Cape Canaveral. Um, the view of just the booster here, oh, you can't see my mouse. <laughs> the view of the booster is when they actually brought the booster back into Port Canaveral a few days after, actually it came in after the crew came back from space. Um, I think this was the fourth flight of this booster with, with the crew on board. Um, so that was really amazing, like getting to go out to the port and actually watch it come back in. So it was just a really, really incredible week. Um, like I said, there's a documentary series on this. I think there's four episodes that are already on Netflix and they're releasing new episodes each week. So now that the launch is over, the next few episodes I assume will be the launch and then returning to earth and it's called uh, Countdown. So mm -hmm. the first four episodes were amazing. Um, have some tissues on hand because it's also a little bit of a tearjerker in some places, but it was really, really well done. Right. Have you, had you seen human launches before? Yeah, I went to the, I think the only other human launch I've been to was the Bob and Doug return to flight launch last oh, summer, right. um, where I actually got this tattoo from my old roommate. Oh, let's see if I can position it. So it says 2020 with a SpaceX X. We did these as like stick and poke tattoos in her grandma's living room. <laughs> it was supposed to symbolize like the launch and surviving 2020. But if you recall, the launch was in like July of 2020. So we were a little bit um, presumptuous in assuming yeah, you we were going to survive COVID the rest of the year. <laughs> so I'm glad we made it. <laughs> yeah, I don't watch human launches. Uh, I don't know what it is like probably the same reason i don't watch horror movies but i've i think i've from teaching i've watched the challenger footage too many times and i just can't like i don't want to be sitting there and watching anything crazy happen um so i always just wait and like i'm like the people who just wait for the information afterwards but yeah it was good to see everything went off without a hitch as usual all that matters is they went up and came back and uh no one got hurt and it looks like, yeah, it was a success. I didn't know it raised that much. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Yeah. I went down to the Cape to watch a shuttle launch, uh, but it was delayed and delayed and delayed by technical problems until I had to come back and teach. So I never got to see it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Mm. Oh, well. All right. Oh, well, that's the news. Uh, we got to run down what a couple or three of the rovers did this summer. Um, so yeah, in, in this one, solar system rundown, we're just going to take over, uh, or let the Mars rovers take over. 
Uh, as a quick summary for everyone, we have three functional rovers on the surface of Mars right now. NASA's Perseverance, NASA's Curiosity, and China's uh, Zhirong rover, which isn't on this, but is somewhere around the top of this ellipse uh, where Perseverance is. I'll update this or get an updated one for next month. Um, the rest of these are either, well, this is from the 90s and early 2000s dead, 70s dead, 90s dead, 2000s dead. 70s dead. This is still alive. Insight and spirit is dead from the 2000s as well. Right? Right. Tanya's just sad. I referred to all these Mars robots as dead. <laughs> Something about spirit it was especially heartbreaking, even though it's been uh, over a decade so far. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 13 years. Get over it. Oh my God. Already? <laughs> um, so as a quick reminder, which one is Curiosity? Curiosity is the one that landed in 2012. It's the NASA rover. Um, and at this point, it is kind of the uh, Mars rover equivalent of Tengen Norquay in that it has become a very high-tech mountain climber. Uh, so Curiosity will get into uh, Phil using this very helpful science map. Uh, where is our beloved six-wheeled uh, mountain climber? Right, okay, well, uh, uh, the background image there uh, kind of shows this long traverse that it's uh, been driving on from the, the landing site, which would be just off the top of that view. Uh, and it's driven across the plains and then across a valley floor in the middle, and now it's starting to climb up the mountain. Uh, so uh, it's it's pretty much at the where the, the blue marker shows it to be there. It's uh, at the uh, on the lower slopes of a mountain, um, and it's right beside a what looks like a sort of a flat shelf uh, of rock, uh, just to the left of that blue marker there, and that's what makes up this big flat blue area, uh, flat grey area on the uh, the inset map. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the green hue pediment, um, and uh, uh, the rover has been driving along, uh, getting closer and closer to that, and just stopped at the base. Uh, uh, well, very close to the base of that to drill a sample just in the last uh, few weeks. So it's just drilled a sample uh, of the rock, um, uh, sort of at the base of uh, of that uh, that flat area, the green hue pediment. Uh, they thought about maybe doing some more drilling there, but they've decided to move on. Uh, and so, right now, pretty they're they're pretty much in the middle of that um, that inset map. And they're going to sit there for several weeks because Mars is just about to move behind the sun uh, and we can't communicate uh, with it while it's behind the sun. Uh, that's not It's not strictly true that you can't uh, because it's not going right behind the solar disk. It, it'll be just kind of uh, a little bit above or below the sun uh, as, as we look at it. Um, but the radio signal is passing through the sun's corona and... Uh, it, it, it can uh, lead to problems, corrupted, uh, corrupted signals, and so on. Um, uh, and uh, although we can actually usually listen to the Mars spacecraft uh, throughout that period, if you don't go right behind the sun, what's dangerous is trying to send instructions up to the Mars spacecraft. Uh, and if those instructions got corrupted, then it really couldn't do anything. Uh, so. Right now, uh, Curiosity is just moving to the place where it's going to sit still for several weeks, uh, and uh, what it, it it'll make sort of weather measurements and that kind of thing. Uh, it won't be totally shut down, but it, uh, we won't be communicating with it for a few weeks. Uh, and actually, that will apply to all of the Mars spacecraft that they will all be out of communication for several weeks. Yeah, it's vacation season for Mars rovers operators. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so early on in the summer, like early June, NASA put out this press release um, just before we check out a few of the image. Um, uh, and this is just kind of updating everyone on the methane issue or the methane on Mars issue. So for those unfamiliar, methane is a bit of a big deal for planetary scientists because, well, on Earth, uh, methane is often, not always, but often associated with biological processes. Um, and in the solar system, it's thought of as either a good indicator of life or a good indicator of conditions decent for life. Um, so methane being present means that there's at least some ingredients uh, that we would like to see uh, for life or at least the conditions for life. So uh, this press release 
touched on the question of methane spikes. So a few times the Curiosity rover has drove and, and, and measured methane, which was presumed to be coming from the ground, um, though it was difficult to identify exactly where it was coming from. Um, and then there was a discrepancy between that and the satellites in orbit above Mars, which namely the trace gas orbiter, which was specifically looking for methane and not finding anything. So um, some, some scientists uh, looked into the question of whether or not you could have methane at the ground being picked up by the rover, but then daytime processes of mixing the atmosphere through warmth meant that the methane as it mixed with everything else became essentially indetectable to anything in orbit, meaning that both the rover and trace gas orbiter would be correct in their assessment of there being both methane and no methane at the same time. Um, Tanya, did I get most of that right? Yeah, that's that's everything I would have said. And this was oh. uh, proposed by a, a fellow Canadian colleague of ours, John Moores. York University. Mm -hmm. The fighting, I don't know what York's mascots are. <laughs> I'll say raccoons because they're in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the methane issue on Mars. Uh, there is methane at the ground, but by the time it gets up to the atmosphere, can't really pick it up. I thought you, I thought I would get something wrong, and then Tanya would have much more to talk about. But apparently, <laughs> I know Mars science just as good as Tanya Harrison. I mean, I guess the the key here is we still haven't solved the mystery of where the methane is coming from in terms of what the source is. But we're finally understanding why we're getting these conflicting measurements, because this has been an ongoing saga for years. Why are some instruments picking up methane and some aren't? Why are there apparent spikes in some places and not mm -hmm. in others? And so this at least explains that part. But we don't know if there's geologic activity or biological activity that's actually generating that methane in the first place. So it kind of <laughs> if you sent a satellite to Mars to look for methane, and then someone was like, oh, you won't be able to see it because by the time it gets to the atmosphere, it's so dilute, uh, you can't pick it up. It'd be a bit of a bummer since the satellite <laughs> is already there. Especially when the name of the satellite is Trace Gas Orbiter. It's so trace, though. Like, <laughs> trace to an extent, but methane is so trace, it cannot be observed, well, at least so far. But I feel like you're coining a new type of um, slang here. Oh, that's so trace. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's got to be other trace gases that are worth identifying. Well, that could very well be, couldn't it? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I think Phil wants to move on. He's <laughs> um, so back to the rover's uh, imagery. This is, Phil was talking about this kind of shelf it's on, and this is the, the ground it's looking at at the moment. Uh, and Phil, as far as I understand that this is kind of, uh, or to the both of you, but Phil, this is a uh, this is evidence of a what might have been once upon a time the bottom of a lake. Yeah, um, I think this is uh, a little further back down the uh, the traverse than uh, where we are right now. But uh, uh, there's uh, certainly there's been uh, evidence of uh, 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 of water rich environments and may maybe maybe uh, lakes in which sediments have been laid when you look at something like this you can easily see that those rocks are made up of multiple layers quite mm -hmm. thin layers um, there are different things that can make that uh, one of them would be uh, if sediments were accumulating uh, in a in a lake and then just falling to the uh, the base so it might be that um, uh, but uh, often when a geologist looks at an outcrop like that that is made of lots and lots of layers what they're thinking is that um, there's some sort of uh, seasonal um, uh, signal in in those layers. Like, let's say, for instance, if you had uh, uh, if you had dust blowing into a lake and then settling down uh, during a particularly windy or dusty season, and then you had a less windy season where there was less coming in, and then next year you have a dusty season and then a less dusty season, and so on, you'd be seeing this sort of cyclical variation in uh, mm -hmm. in in the layers so uh that that might be the kind of thing that you're looking at there and you've got to check the composition and see what what things are like that uh uh so it it certainly seems to be telling us that uh uh you know that something has been happening over quite a long period of time in order to build up all of those layers uh so yeah it's, it's not geologically yeah. very interesting yeah 
And um, yeah, we see it here at Panorama. So sorry, Phil. Yeah, that image you, we were just looking at was from early July, July 8th. Uh, yeah. This is a much more recent, this is from Seoul, 3,225 or in Earth time, September 1st. Um, right. you know, and, the, and the rover has hardly moved since then. So we're actually okay. very close to that spot still. Yeah, and I, I just want to highlight the the excellent image processing and stitching by Damia Buick, who's one of the users on unmanned space flight as well. Um, so this is where we'll leave leave curiosity for now. Um, and like you say, it's essentially taking a nap for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump ahead to NASA's newest, shiniest member of the family, Perseverance. Um, Perseverance, as a reminder, landed just uh, in 2020, um, in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, on Mars. It's a NASA rover, has a helicopter with it, so that might be one way of remembering. It's the one with the helicopter, it's not the one climbing a mountain. Um, and it's also the one collecting very specific samples for a very specific reason, which is that in the future, we're hoping another rover or something can come along and grab those samples and bring them back to us here on Earth. Um, of course, the crux of it then is finding where to take samples. Um, and this was from August 6th, about halfway through the summer. Uh, Perseverance took its first shot at trying to get a sample out of Martian rock, uh, and it failed and everything literally fell apart. Tanya, uh, what happened here? Why were those, why were no tubes filled with rocks? So this was a little bit of a mystery at first and certainly slightly disappointing for the team because they were excited to get their first sample. Uh, and after looking at it for a couple of days, they realized that the rock itself must have been so powdery that it wasn't cohesive or sorry, coherent enough to form a core. And so mm -hmm. part of it probably ended up in the tailings pile and probably they could see what looked like some of it was actually at the bottom of the, the drill hole. Um, but when they tried the, the next time around, they they drilled somewhere else, they were actually able to get a successful sample. So um, this is a little bit reminiscent of the uh, the heat flow probe issues with Insight. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't get a successful mm -hmm. measurement of what you were looking for, but it taught you something about the properties of the rocks, which is still interesting from mm -hmm. a scientific standpoint. Sugarcoating it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that problem only applied to that specific rock because they were able to get a sample later on. Well, spoiler alert, but yeah. Um, so a, a month later, Percy tried again, and this is my uh, my description of the series of events. So number one is where we left off. First sample attempt, it failed, um, and Percy backed up and then saw some rocks in the distance and went to those. Uh, so in number three, you see it getting closer to some rocks. Number four, you see it picking out a particularly interesting rock by rover standards. And then in number five, it picks out a spot on that rock. And in number six, it kind of grinds with it. It used uh, its its brush for this, I imagine, uh, a, a drill bit or a tube sized hole uh, to set up where it's going to drill. So almost like setting the spot where you're gonna put your nail into the wood. And then uh, in number seven, it drilled away and pulled out. And in number eight, it looked inside of its tube and its tube was full of rock, so it was successful. And then it drove away. Did I get that right, Phil? That's right, yeah. There you go. Um, and uh, one, one thing I would just add briefly, so the first attempt to do that failed uh, because the rock was so crumbly. And there's a little bit of evidence there that might help us to uh, understand that. The rock is absolutely dead flat with the ground. So if the rock was really hard, uh, it could withstand sand blowing over it and gradually sandblasting it. But because the rock was quite soft, sand blowing over it over millions of years kind of worn it down to a flat surface at ground level. Uh, so that's what those rocks looked like. But we can see in your image four there that the rocks there are standing up above the surface. The sand is still blowing over them in the wind all the time, but they're resistant enough. They're solid, hard enough uh, that that they remain standing on the surface like a, you know, as a, as a separate uh, boulder. Uh, they're not worn right down to ground level. So that tells you they're harder. And sure enough, when they drill into it, uh, uh, they get a successful core. And they actually did that twice. Yeah. yeah, and they're looking, well, when they get back from fall vacation, 
they'll be looking for a third sample site, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I like this. This <laughs> this reminds me of like taking a picture of a kid at the beach with the hole they dug. Because you can see here, Percy's looking at the hole and then looking at uh, what is now a cropped out robotic arm taking this picture. Um, mm -hmm. So Tanya, you're a geologist. Have you ever taken a picture of you standing with a hole? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Probably yes, because in grad school round one, I took a whole class on soils and literally every field trip was just going to a different place and digging a hole and looking at the layers of dirt in the hole every week. <laughs> the glamorous life of a geologist. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I follow a few of you on Twitter and there's a lot of like, look at this rock I have and like a hammer. And like, look at this rock I chipped away at. But I'm surprised you don't love this photo more or you're not more excited because I this has you written all over it. I don't know why. Oh, I love this photo. I love any of the ones where the rover kind of looks like, hey, look what I did. This is yeah. Cool. yeah. And even though like usually when you make these selfies, you know, this is a stitch of probably anywhere between like 50 and 70 some odd images to make this view. You usually you tend to lose the arm, but you can see at the very bottom near the wheel of the rover, part of the shadow, that looks like it's actually the shadow of the turret, oh, yeah. which has the camera on board. Um, so it's kind of cool to see like the artifacts of that left behind. Yeah. It just looks so proud. It's like, look, yeah, look what I did. Look, I put two mm -hmm. holes. Hey, why are there two holes? It, both of its samples are from the same rock? Yes. Uh, and the reason is that there will be two distinct sample caches on the surface. Uh, they'll drive around for a year or, or so, well, a Martian year, let's say, or, or, or so, uh, and collect some samples. And then they will deposit those samples uh, for a future pickup. But then they'll go on and spend another year or two, Martian year or two, exploring and collecting more samples. And then they'll set those down and make a, uh, an extra cache. Uh, and of course, the second one is actually the more interesting because it's got more stuff in it. Um, but uh, the thing is that you don't really want to save the entire process, you know, work for years and years on the surface and then put one single cache down. Because if mm -hmm. something breaks down along the way, you may be in a, you may break down in a situation where uh, you haven't had a chance to or don't get a chance to deposit samples on the surface. And then there's no way that uh, any rover coming afterwards can pick them up. It can't extract right. them from the interior of the rover. So uh, basically they will work for a, a Martian year, put a cache down uh, as a kind of contingency and then drive off and collect more samples and make a second cache. Okay, so uh, these two samples will be split up and one will be in the first drop. Yeah, so, so for the important samples in the early part of the mission, they will take two and there can be one in each cache. Yeah, okay. I prefer to them as tubes, not, not samples, but that's just me. Whatever. <laughs> I mean, if it gets stuck in the rover, then it'll just make for a really interesting call for the fetch rover, where yeah, it's then like, like battle bots design, because yeah, it's got to like nice. saw into Perseverance. Jaws to of life. I, I, I mean, it would be interesting if they did have to extract them somehow from the sample cache. Yeah. No, it wouldn't be. No, no. <laughs> I don't want to do that. The Mars Not Exploration me. Program team would just cry and be like, we give up. <laughs> Well, it'd be, it'd be a good while from now, so I'm sure there'll be some good robot technology to cut open rovers and grab tubes. Or by then, Starship will have landed, and Elon's just going to walk right up and pull it out and then take a picture, like, holding in front of a camera and just being like... Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Unrelated. You know who I really like? Never listen to her music. Big fan, though. Grimes. She's great. <laughs> right, Tanya? You've never listened to her music? I don't think so. I think she's on a song with Miley, and I think I've heard that. <laughs> but other than that, no. I I'm not sure I can name any Grimes songs. I don't know. No. I'm more of like a tool kind of person. <laughs> tool is good. Um, all right. Well, we don't really need to cover what, what uh, Percy's going to be up to next, but we can cover uh, um, Ingenuity, which has continued to defy uh what was planned for it so throughout the summer it took its ninth through 14th flights uh tanya have you been following along with Ginny, or are you just a Ginny poser <laughs> i think Ginny is awesome i mean yeah. it's so incredible to see how wildly successful this tech demo which is now an operational demo has been the photos are so cool 
Um, I love it whenever we get any of the animations where you can actually see it flying from mm -hmm. the helicopter itself. Yeah. And yeah, it just blows my mind every time. Oops. Um, yeah, it's been snapping yeah. images and it's been, it's actually been doing what, uh, what some people hoped or surmised, but were, were kind of thought of as unlikely was looking ahead at potential science targets, which yeah. is, again, I think I even said this last time, just was not foreseen at all. No, that's right. And, uh, and, uh, I think right now, um, the Rover team are actually making good use of those images, which is something they hadn't really thought they would be doing. I'd be curious to know what kind of addition or changes to like Rover resource in terms of energy and time has had to be adjusted. I mean, this is something those teams are really good at doing regardless, but this is a very big change to the mission's operations for good, but must be a logistical nightmare in other ways. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. You think they've got it all figured out? I mean, it's <laughs> probably this very similar to doing route planning with high-rise images, but now you just have way higher resolution images to do your planning with. But you have a whole other piece of hardware to like keep tabs on and like the engineering team that was probably like, oh, we'll be done after so long. Mm -hmm. That's true. Up. I don't know. When you get the images back from a lot of these cameras, it's, I don't know about ingenuity, but certainly like when we were doing cameras on Opportunity, for example, it, w it really wasn't that much effort to get the images back. And then they all just kind of, kind of come in as a flood and you check through them to make sure they look okay and the camera's working properly. So I don't think actually sending the data back from that standpoint is is much of a lift, but I'm sure the operational time they're spending in, in actually running the helicopter as a whole and planning the flights for the helicopter, that's probably way more intense than actually using the data from the helicopter to influence drive decisions for person. Yeah, and that's what I was kind of getting at is I just, I mean, again, these teams are not unfamiliar with having a, 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 um, enhanced missions or changes to mission operations. But I mean, it, they didn't expect to be dragging, not dragging along, having a <laughs> helicopter with them all this way. So good for them. Um, and it's awesome. Yeah. Last but not least, uh, the newest member of the Mars rover family, Zhirong, uh, which is a Chinese rover that landed in May of 2021. We talked about it back uh, before we left for the summer. This is it actually taken by a, a little thing, I guess, camera, the little tiny camera that it left on the ground and then backed up, uh, which is actually an interesting new way to do Mars selfies that I don't think anyone else has done. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Phil, I don't, this was the best I could find. Uh, I think you've added to this, um, but right. so far as I can see, they're driving in mostly a straight line. <laughs> right, so uh, this image has north on the right-hand side, and they're driving towards the left-hand side, so they're going south. Um, and uh, the particular thing that's interesting about this uh, image, uh, I would say, is that you can see that the, the line that has been drawn with little dots along it showing which day they were at which spot, uh, it doesn't exactly coincide with the dark line in the background, which is the tracks mm -hmm. on an orbiter image. Um, so uh, th for some reason, uh, the map and the image are not lining up. And that's, that's uh, not a problem with, with, <laughs> with, with the, the drawn map there. There's, there's something, there's something uh, wrong uh, somewhere in the, in the mapping process. Uh, and uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that is. I think it might be a very slight difference in the definition of the map projection between the map projected image uh, and the map used to plot the path. Mm. Uh, anyway, basically what they've done is they've landed in a place uh, where, which is really quite smooth and easy to drive on. Uh, and the white lines are uh, sand or dust drifts, um, kind of like dunes. You can call them dunes if you like. Um, uh, and the rover has been driving along and visiting several of them as it as it goes, uh, as well as looking at individual rocks and things like that. Uh, but they're heading south, 
uh, and hopefully they will be able to drive you. Yeah, here's a nice sort of panoramic view of the surface. You can see how flat it is and how relatively few obstacles there are. Off on the right there is the, the uh, back shell uh, and parachute mm -hmm. landing system. And uh, we've got another picture closer in than that uh, showing the parachute. First time a, a parachute has ever been imaged uh, close up like that on the surface uh, of Mars. Yeah, it's never been a traverse target. <clears throat> no, um, that's that's right. Uh, was it? Do you know if it was a target or if it was just close? Oh, I think they they wanted to have a have a look at it. Okay. Uh, it's interesting to uh, to see yeah. it there. Uh, this is maybe one the of my new favorite surface pictures. Yeah. The only other time that anything like this has been done is when the Opportunity rover had a look at it, the heat shield part of its landing system. Uh, and they, they had quite a close close inspection of that. Yeah. Tanya, you were saying something? I said this might be one of my new favorite surface images. Like the, the yeah. detail in the parachute and the, the back shell are just, it's just really incredible. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, Some sort of butte or very far away mountain range. I don't know. What yes, there's a, a nice hill in the background there. And when we look at orbiter images of the area, they look like little volcanoes. Uh, nice. Whether that's a, a lava volcano or a mud volcano is not really quite uh, clear at this point, but it does look like a little volcanic cone. Hmm. I'm always amazed at your, your ability to understand the depth of images. Because like to me, that could be a butte that's like 100 meters away or mountains like many, many well, yeah, uh, yeah, but uh, I've seen it on the orbital images, ah. so, uh, so I know it's, uh, it's about. <laughs> yeah, I cheated. <laughs> it's about three thousand meters away. Ah. Oh, not close at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, it's time for Phil's deep dive, um, and uh, it's the respectful time of the show where Phil goes full super scion professor and brings us uh, up to date on something more obscure than just the big missions. Um, and this time around, I believe Phil is outlining uh, some future plans for lunar exploration by Japan. Yeah, so let's have a look at the next uh, slide there. Yeah, so uh, uh, three different spacecraft there, uh, not all to scale, actually. The, the, the red and black one, that is actually the smallest of all of those. Uh, so uh, it's just a random collection of these things. Uh, but yeah, I want to look at what Jan Japan is planning to do just next year. Uh, next year, there are going to be quite a lot of attempts to land on the moon, and uh, Japan is going to try to do it three times with these three separate spacecraft. So let's move on and have a look at the, the next one. Next slide there. Yeah, yeah, Japan will try to land three times next year with these three spacecraft. One called Omotenashi, uh, which is like a little CubeSat. That was the that big one with the red color on it oh. in the previous image. And then Slim. Uh, a small lander testing a new way of landing uh, and also trying to test precision landing technology. And then a private landing mission called Hakuto R. Um, uh, there we go. All right, so let's have a look at uh, Omotenashi here. Um, so this, uh, the name is a kind of tortured acronym. Oh. You can see written there, uh, acronym made out of English words, but in Japanese, as a word, it means hospitality. Whoa. So the uh, acronym comes from English words to create. Yes. I wonder if there's a, a, a name for that. When an the acronym, Japanese probably have a name for that. Probably. Uh, oh, yeah. Very likely, I'm always yeah. fascinated by names. Like there's backronyms and then there's Stupid names. Stupid English acronym. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, um, so uh, they this is going to be launched with Artemis 1, the very the first uh, launch of uh, of NASA's brand new giant rocket, uh, the Space Launch System, uh, on the Ar Artemis 1 mission, which is going to go to the moon but not take people with it, is going to launch probably early next, uh, very early next year. Um, and uh, it ha it's carrying 12 CubeSats, uh, little, little satellites. Um, and uh, some of them are going to go into lunar orbit. Some of them are going to go and look at uh, an asteroid or do heliophysics type stuff in space. One of them is a biology experiment. But one of them will try to land. Uh, and that's Omotenashi. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide here. We'll have a look at a uh, picture of it. So the idea is 
you're carried up into space on the Artemis rocket and then the upper stage pushes uh, it towards the moon and as it comes relatively close to the moon maybe sort of I don't know the exact amount say 10,000 kilometers away or something it ejects this little uh, spacecraft and uh, uh, Omotenashi then uses its own little thruster to push itself towards the moon uh, as it comes in towards the moon on a collision trajectory uh, it uh, it's going to inflate an airbag and then drop off the solar panels and stuff like that that they don't need anymore fire a little thruster to reduce the velocity to zero just above the surface mm -hmm. uh, and then fall to the surface protected by the airbags and the tiny little surface probe which is only 700 grams tiny little thing uh, it's really only designed to survive uh, it's this is an engineering test it will ostensibly do a tiny bit of science by trying to measure radiation uh, on the surface uh, and also during the the, the flight but um, it's not really designed for science it's designed to show that a tiny little CubeSat could land on the moon and once you know that you can do it then you could imagine flying a CubeSat on lots of different uh, missions uh, and trying to get lots of little landings that, that could uh, accomplish something more scientifically anyway uh, that's what it's mm -hmm. going to try to do and if we go to the next slide you can see where they want to uh, do this um, I started out with a, a map shows the whole moon in two hemispheres there uh, and uh, there's a kind of dark circle which represents the uh, the sum of all of the different possible places they could land uh, the original idea was um, when the spacecraft is released it sort of pushes itself towards the moon and they wanted to try to go just have a kind of a grazing encounter with the edge of the moon so if you're looking at the moon approaching it you could go anywhere around the edge and that defines a circle on the surface of the moon and then you just pick somewhere around there like say at the nine o'clock position or the eleven o'clock position or something like that and that's where you try to land but it's somewhere on that circle uh, that was the original uh, approach um, and uh, uh, let's go to the next slide there and we'll look at uh, one of the studies that was done uh, for uh, this attempt to land, uh, you'd come into the surface um, and basically hit the surface. And they had two different analyses, one where they just assumed the moon was a sphere and another where they used real topography, which puts the impacts in slightly different places um, and well, the landings. So you come in, you try to land, hopefully you slow down enough that you can actually land there so this was one of the studies that they did uh, trying to land in this area let's go to the next slide but it's a very rough area with lots of craters and mountains so then they did another study in a place that was very smooth uh, where it was perhaps more likely that you could land without slamming into a hillside on your way down but now let's go to the next slide uh, uh, and this is just a blow up of that other other one and what they've decided now and I only heard about this uh, very recently uh, is that instead of trying to have this very shallow approach, uh, almost a grazing uh, 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 incidents uh, encounter with the moon, they're going to come straight down towards the center. And I think the reason is that it's easy to deal with that if you don't have very precise control over where the little spacecraft will be. So they're going to try to come down to that point. They'll make a nearly vertical descent, fire that little thruster to slow down to almost zero velocity just above the surface, uh, and and then uh, land protected by airbags and the that new approach means that they will be near the center of the circle instead of uh, out on its periphery uh, and uh, probably in Mare Smithy which is on the edge of the moon as seen from the earth so that's where we think that they will be aiming okay let's move on to the this next this is interesting one. like as uh as we reestablish like new ways of doing things and we shrink back down to like cube size stuff and stuff we've never done, we go back to like what used to happen during the cold war and the space race of like, Oh, uh, we're just figuring out if we can do this, there won't be any science data except for like radiation data. <laughs> and like that used to happen all the time with like the Lunas and the Mariners and stuff where it was just like, we're just seeing if we could do this and there was no real science returns. It's interesting where with some of the new technology we tested out, we're kind of back at that, at least for the smaller, kind of yeah for that particular missions. mission yeah yeah okay let's move on there now so the next lander will be much more capable this is called slim a smart lander for investigating the moon um 
and it will fly as a secondary payload on an, with an astronomy satellite. And it has a, a unique way of landing. So this little kind of cartoon illustrates it. It comes down towards the surface uh, with a thruster breaking its, uh, its descent. And when it gets very, very close to the surface, a little off-center thrust will fire in the second image there and tip it over. Uh, and so that means that as it's coming down, it's going to touch on just one little landing leg that is kind of in the corner in the, of that view, the one that's closest to the ground. That touches down and then the spacecraft will topple over onto its other landing legs. Um, that might seem like a strange way of landing, but the idea is that you could land on almost any slope. So if you, you know, even if the area you land on is ostensibly flat, but there's a crater and you land on the side of the crater, uh, for some landers, that would be the end of the mission. But with this one, it could touch down, it would tip over onto the slope and it could survive on that slope. So they're testing that technique for landing, which they think is is a potentially a more robust way of landing. Uh, at least it's worth, worth uh, experimenting with that. Um, and then they're going to actually do some science uh, and this will include uh, using uh, an infrared spectrometer to measure surface composition. Now, where are you going to go? They had two original uh, places, one on the left there in the Marius Hills and one on the right at a crater called Theophilus. Uh, so let's go to the next slide and look at the Marius Hills site. And uh, uh, this is uh, a place with a lot of volcanic domes and some uh, lava channels you can see there. But when you zoom right into one of those lava channels, as this sequence does, there's a little dark spot right in the middle of it, uh, and it's a, a hole, uh, a, a thought to be a skylight, uh, an opening into a subterranean lava tube. Uh, the ja Japanese are particularly interested in these because they discovered them. Although people had kind of predicted that there would be uh, lava tubes like that on the moon, it was the Japanese with data from the Kaguya orbiter um, uh, back in the early 2000s who actually discovered the first ones. And this was one of the three that they discovered in, uh, in their first study. Uh, so the first thought was that Slim would land very close to one of those. Um, but uh, they've had second thoughts about that. They wanted to go to somewhere that was compositionally more interesting. Uh, and so this is the second idea. Now they're going to go to uh, the ejector of Theophilus crater. Uh, and the reason is that uh, from orbital data, we believe that there is olivine in the surface at this location. Now, the olivine tells an interesting story. Uh, it forms very, very deep in the, in the crust or, or, or down below the crust in the mantle. People usually associate it just with the mantle. That's very deep. So something has to dig it up. And a gigantic impact would dig it up. That would be the impact uh, that formed the Nectaris Basin. Uh, and that would dig up olivine, among other things, and expose it on the surface, probably in one of the big mountains that form the, a basin ring in this big circular kind of concentric uh, uh, impact structure. Later on, the crater Theophilus hits one of the, these olivine-rich mountains and throws the ejector out all around it. So now there's olivine in the ejector of Theophilus. Um, but that can then get kind of covered up with sprays of ejector from other craters too. So to be, make sure that you actually get it, you'd want to go to a place where uh, a small fresh crater has penetrated through the local surface material, the regolith, and exposed some of that olivine in its ejector. And that's, that this is, so this is one of the spots. There's the little crater, it's called Shioli, uh, and it's exposed uh, olivine in its ejector that is come through these several steps uh, described uh, before. And the slim lander will land on the edge of its ejector blanket just a few hundred meters away from the crater uh, and attempt to get a composition uh, measurement from that. Am I reading it well? Like, is, the, is this a directional, like, is there ejector out this way or do we- Yeah, yeah, the ejector yeah. would be going out all around yeah. that little crater, yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, and the last of these three Japanese missions uh, is uh, uh, left over from the good old Google Lunar X Prize. Um, uh, Hakuto uh, was one of the, uh, the competitors in the Google Lunar X Prize, uh, which ended without anybody winning it. Um, but uh, it has been continued by a Japanese company, iSpace. Uh, 
and uh, they are going to launch sometime in the towards the middle of the year probably um, on a completely privately funded uh, mission uh, and uh, there is a Canadian connection here and also uh, a connection with the United Arab Emirates uh, the United Arab Emirates is getting more and more into space exploration they have a Mars orbiter operating at Mars right now uh, and this is their first lunar mission uh, so they are going to uh, land a rover. Oops, there we go. So this is the, the patch for their Emirates lunar mission. Um, they have a little rover called Rashid. Uh, they had the rover, but they didn't have a way of getting there. So they've teamed up with the iSpace lander, the Hukutoar uh, lander, uh, which will carry their rover to uh, the moon. And on this little rover, we have, uh, and also I think separately on the lander, uh, we have some Canadian uh, components uh, with a connection to Western, I suppose mm -hmm. I really ought to mention, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the rover will be carrying uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems for recognizing interesting targets, uh, uh, things to go and, and look at on the surface, um, uh, put together by a, a group of uh, people that we know from Western um, in a company called Mission Control, uh, currently uh, working out of Ottawa. So it's great to see uh, uh, that Canadian connection. There are two other Canadian uh, companies as well, providing uh, other, uh, other parts of this whole thing, including navigation for the precise landing of the lander and so on. Anyway, let's look on to the next slide and see where they're going to go. And they have said they're going to go into this place called Lacus Somniorum, uh, the uh, the lake of sleep. Um, like this crater. Oh, they could dreams, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Danny L A R Danny. Um, yeah, so we don't know exactly where in that rather large area they're going to land, but somewhere in there is the landing site. Uh, and that's uh, north of Apollo 16 and the Soviet Lunar Cod 2, uh, uh, just on the edge of Mare Serenitatis. So uh, we know roughly where they're going. Okay, so that's a quick look ahead at three potential landings next year. Wow, that uh, that tilting land, that tilted landing is like fillet on purpose. Just... <laughs> it also <laughs> looks like R2D2 falling over. Yeah, it did look a bit like that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's. It's a, like, I mean, Philly was able to snap picks and still do something half useful. And like, yeah, it's not, it's not a stupid idea. I'm surprised. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'm surprised it hadn't come up before, but I never thought of it either. It's because you're not oh. sure. No, oh, that's true. Um, all right. So to wrap up with the game, uh -huh. uh, as you see, Phil is the standing champion for the you know, Space Club XV battle. Um, today's game is inspired by our penchant in the space community, uh, mostly among science communicators like our beloved Tanya, to use comparisons <laughs> to explain the sometimes... All the things to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, there's a compliment coming. Um, <laughs> you know, there's some incredible sizes and scales in the solar system that we deal with, and analogies and metaphors and comparisons are helpful. Um, so, like, the ISS is the size of a football field. That good you know that's good i like that one um but others are more useless or you know sometimes you get into like oh it's three three and a half times the size of the gray wall of china and i think like i don't know how big the gray wall of china is all i know is that that object you just described is bigger than some portion of china um <laughs> so size analogies can be helpful but uh, sometimes they're just useless and the ones you'll see here are all very useless so uh -oh. what are the rules of the game um well first they're going to be guessing uh i'm going to give them an equatorial radius radius comparison and they'll have to guess the planet um equatorial radius as you can see is the distance from the middle of a planet up to at least on earth mean sea level um, or on a circle or sphere from the middle out to the edge. Mm. Um, for comparison, Earth is um, 6,371 kilometers in length for its equatorial radius. Um, Phil, was that grown a concern of accuracy? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. Okay, okay. So are these um, comparisons that you came up with or you took these out of science communications that you've seen on the internet and you just thought they were absurd? 
No, that would have been way too much work. I came up with these, which okay. was also still a lot of work. And I also just didn't want to dig through all the many documentaries and books where I've seen these comparisons because there's often a lot of good ones. And I don't know how long it would have taken to find that many bad ones. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. know I've seen bad ones. A good way to find them actually is Wolfram Alpha. I yes, don't know if so, you tried that. Is that what you used? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I used uh, two websites were very helpful for this, Wolfram Alpha and The Measure of Things. Okay. Um, so, um, for example, with Earth, there's also, you could say the comparison of the Earth's uh, equatorial radius is the length of the Amazon River, roughly. So the beginning of the Amazon River would run from the core of the Earth out to mean sea level. Um, now, equatorial radius itself isn't that helpful because most people don't really associate the size of planets with equatorial radius. I don't. Uh, I, I'm more interested in circumference, even though most geographers don't seem to be. Um, but you will take turns, as usual, guessing. You will receive up to three clues. The first clue is mostly useless. But if you guess correct on the first clue, you get three points. Huh. Or you can opt to see the next clue. The second mm -hmm. clue is slightly more helpful, but still vague. And if you guess correct on the second clue, you get two points. Or you can opt to see the third and final clue as well. And if you guess correctly after that, you only get one point. And the third clue, it doesn't give it away, but it's certainly much more helpful. However, yeah. when you choose to guess at whatever point, if you get it wrong, the other person can steal. So this de-incentivizes guessing and oh. it disincentivizes guessing after the first clue. So you could go for three points right away, but if you get it wrong, uh, the other person has a shot at it as well. This also means that there's the potential that no one gets any points, period, and you both lose. You've right. leveled up the complexity compared to previous trivia. Well, mm. you know, I know Phil likes um, trivia, and I wouldn't even call this trivia because, as you'll see, some of them, you, there's no way to do it. But I think we can get started. Are there any questions? No, no, fire away. away. Okay, so sorry, I should mention also, the eight major planets minus Earth and one other. So one major planet has been removed to make guessing harder. And Pluto and Ceres have been included. And there's eight total. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Phil, would you like to guess first or second since you're the reigning champ? Second. All right. Ooh. Pressure's on, Tanya. <laughs> All right, this is just a little reminder for, for our viewers of what, <laughs> what we're talking about. All right, Tanya, first clue, 2,750,000 blue whales. Would you like the next clue or would you like to venture a guess? 2.75 million blue whales. Uh, I'm gonna take the next clue. All right, good choice. <laughs> 3.4 times the Great Wall of China. Uh, that doesn't seem like very much, which makes me think blue whales are smaller than my brain is envisioning. 3.4 times the Great Wall of China. I had I looked this up. The Great Wall of China is way longer than I thought. Really? Huh, okay. Exceptionally longer than I thought. And we're talking radius. Uh... Mercury? No. Damn. Phil, would you like to steal? Well, you, you can steal. Saturn? Close. Uh, so I'll give the third clue, but 11 times Earth, it is Jupiter. Ah, oh, that was going to be my other guess at the blue whales one. <laughs> Wait, so you were going to guess between Mercury, the smallest, <laughs> and Jupiter, the biggest. Well, I thought... 22.75 million blue whales sounded like so much. I'm like, that's got to be Jupiter. It is a lot. 3.4 times the Great Wall of China. I so, was like, oh, that that's not that much. But I guess I'm also severely underestimating yes. the length of the Great Wall of China. You are, as was I. So Jupiter's equatorial uh, radius is 69,911. The Great Wall of China is 20,000 some kilometers. What? Yep. Phil says no. What? What? Let me look that, this up. That can't be right. 
like China's not that big. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What am I? What? Are, what unit of measurement? What are you? Are you doing centimeters? Twenty thousand kilometers would be half the circumference of the Earth, right? Yeah. You're right. That's... You, you think in my circumference research, I would have noted this. <laughs> um. Oh, I probably a diameter. Either way, um, I'm gonna say no point for this. <laughs> We're throwing this one out because you screwed it up. <laughs> well, um, there may be chaos introduced if if um, if if orders of magnitude were confused. Sean Doran says you lose a science point, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> it's a geography point, but if anybody, uh, somebody that is in I the can audience do it right now. No, I want that. Well, fine. You can do it too. I was going to have the audience look up how long the Great Wall of China is, but I'm sure the internet will also give you like seven different answers because, you know, that's how the internet works. For length, it claims 21,000. 21,000 kilometers? I mean, it's winding. <laughs> winding. But it, that would have to be like, I, that doesn't seem right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not giving ancient Chinese civilizations enough credit. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, I mean, multiple internets say so. Hmm. Well, we'll have to figure out exactly what's intended there. Yes. Yeah, Some other time. <laughs> but moving <laughs> swiftly on, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> you got somewhere to be, Phil? Okay, Phil, this is yours. Ooh, ouch. 1,253 um, leagues. Uh, right, okay. So let me just think about that for one second here. Um, I'm thinking that that might be Mars. Oh, you're taking a shot right away. <laughs> yes. Uh, it was a very good guess. Uh, are, do you remember the rules? You could have waited for more clues, but you just wanted three points? Yeah. Okay. She wants to hold on to that that um, badge of honor. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that is incorrect. Tanya, for the steal. Oh. Uh, I'm going to get the next clue. Oh, wait. If I ask for the next clue, does Phil still get to go first? No, 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 you don't get another clue. You just get a steal attempt on the same thing. Oh, okay. Uh, Venus. That is correct. Ah, oh, very good. I shouldn't have said it was close. That was that was a yeah. You, that was that was also your fault. <laughs> no. um, Thirteen point six Grand Canyon length. Point yeah. five Earth. Which now that I look at that, I have to confess I was thinking about um, diameter and not radius. So my mistake. See, isn't it easy to confuse? Them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Venus is 6,051 kilometers uh, equatorial diameter. Radius. <laughs> Honestly, the only planet radius I know is Mars. I don't I don't even remember the Earth other than you know, 6,000 6, something. I All right, confused. Tanya. 20,000 <laughs> Christmas trees. Now, this depends on what you define as the average height of a Christmas tree. Yeah. I'm going to venture, I guess. Well, I don't know. I guess mine's... I'm going to say six to eight feet, somewhere between there. So seven? I don't know. <laughs> somewhere between six and eight. <laughs> that would be seven. Uh, I'm going to take the next clue. Okay. 45 times the max depth of Mariana's Trench. Damn. Uh, the depth yep. from the top of the trench to the bottom, or like the depth from the top of the ocean to the bottom of the Mariana's Trench? Uh, from mean sea level to the bottom of the deepest part of Mariana's Trench. Oh, I'm going to say Saturn then. Oh, no. What? <gasps> oh. Hmm. Uh -huh. Series? Correct. What? Ha! Whoa. This is, uh, I guess Mariana's Trench is not as deep as you think it is. <laughs> the deepest part from mean sea level, I think, is seven miles. Okay. It's not like that Great Wall of China, which is apparently a billion miles long. So, Danny, what's that apostrophe doing in the in Marianas? I'm gonna have to. Uh, hold you it's her trench. <laughs> Fire on us. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I don't know why it's called Marianas Trench. Um, well, it's not but, named after someone called Mariana. <laughs> well, it should be. <laughs> but yeah, when I see, has an important when question. I hear a name with an S at the end, <laughs> I presume it's possessive. Uh, okay. 
but I guess it comes from Latin. Like, like that's mm, probably a Spanish word, I would think. Uh, but, yeah. So ultimately, it's derived from one of the Romance languages. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so Phil got the steal for two points. I should be keeping score. Hey. <laughs> Tanya has three, Phil has two. And Phil has five, doesn't he? No. no. Oh, no, wait. None of us got the... Never mind. Yeah. I'm, I'm here just giving Phil three points. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, it is Phil's turn. Mm. Oh, she... <laughs> 47,516 VHS cassette tapes lying lengthwise. Uh, uh, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, ooh, tricky. <laughs> All right, so, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. okay, so let's go on. five thousand. Hmm, trying to work this out. <laughs> How many people in the audience are too young to remember what a VHS cassette tape Where's is? Where's my? <laughs> I have yeah, a copy of uh, Signs on VHS. It's like. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so how about I speculate that that might be um, Neptune? Oh, no. Ah. Tanya? Uranus. No. Ah, damn. I like that you trusted Phil and thought he was in the ballpark. <laughs> um, no, it's Mercury. Ah. Mercury is only 1.9 the length of Cal California lakes? That's impressive. Mm -hmm. That means Mercury is small slash California is really big. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mercury is 2,439 kilometers in equatorial radius. Okay. Wow. All Spoiled right. My mind. We're halfway through. Tanya's up three to two. All right. Tanya, <laughs> 440,000 leaning tower of pieces. <laughs> the equatorial radius of what? I'm going to go with the next clue. Mostly because I'm having fun seeing multiple clues. Oh, this is helpful. 0.4 Saturns. Uh, is this one Uranus? That feels too small. Never mind. Phil, would you like to steal? <laughs> oh, Neptune. That is correct. I figured Phil was just wishing you get that wrong because 0.4 Saturn <laughs> is a pretty decent clue. Oh, I didn't same. realize oh, Neptune yeah. was that much smaller than Saturn. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I kind yeah. of forget sometimes how much bigger Saturn and Jupiter are than everything else. Uh, well, namely Neptune and Uranus, but. Yeah. <laughs> but also everything else. Well, not the Great Wall of China. That thing's huge. <laughs> 3.9 Earth. Uh, yeah, Neptune coming in at 24,622 kilometers in equatorial radius. Uh, Phil, 25,000 Pyramid of Gaza heights. Do you mean Pyramid of Giza? Yes. Uh, I'm going to run a quick fact check here. <laughs> Pretty sure there is also a Pyramid of Gaza. Nope, nope. Giza. Well, you know, it's okay. Danny's not, uh, you know, a, an English major. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a there's a typo in the question. Ah, oh, dear, oh dear. <laughs> All right, okay. Let me just think about this for a minute. So, if I, if I, if I, if I, if Mercury, Mercury. Tanya, would you like to steal? Uh, what planets have we not done yet? Mars. You are correct. Oh, well done. <laughs> that was only process of elimination. I actually had oh, no Oh, that's, idea. come on. I have no idea how tall the Pyramid of Giza is. Or the, I don't even know, I have no idea how long the length of the Volga River is. Hmm. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, that would have given it away, I think. <laughs> uh, Tanya. 1,022 <laughs> Winnipeg. Oh. Is this the the radius of Winnipeg? 
No, this is the length, I believe, at the longest point. <laughs> um, I Googled length of Winnipeg, which, you know. I'm sure Stats is, Canada just had that information. You know, they keep that for all the cities. <laughs> I mean, length is not a formal measurement of cities typically, but um, I think I... thousand Winnipegs uh series wait we already had series <laughs> oh Phil Saturn Uranus oh God. you guys are going for the big clues or the big points 15th distance to the moon one fourth circumference yeah. of the Earth. I was really tempting fate by yeah, mixing my measurements there, but mm -hmm. um, so the new motto for Uranus can be "Land of a Thousand Winnipegs." Wow, that would really, <laughs> really get more missions to Uranus for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, twenty-five thousand three hundred sixty-two kilometers equatorial radii. Uh, Phil. Ouch. <laughs> okay so uh, let me say that would be that's a yeah tanya has six points phil has four yes. pluto wow <laughs> you're a genius phil's right S strike is no good. just very lucky <laughs> <laughs> he's also yeah i guess there's process elimination i like to believe that you had that figure somewhere in your brain 0.5 the Colorado River, 1.9 Earth. Pluto is 1,188 kilometers equatorial radius. All right. Um, that's it. Oh. Phil wins with a ah! final oh. Hail Mary <laughs> knowledge of bowling lane length. <laughs> um, before he, I, I was glad to hear Sean Duran's watching. I wanted to towards the end uh, at the end give a nod to him whose image we used again <laughs> uh curiosity taking a jump and dami abuik as well another wonderful image processor uh whose work we used and credited uh, as you should always do when using these people's incredible work so thank you to them thank you to wolfram alpha and the measure of things for making this stupid game possible <laughs> um we'll be back next month with definitely more knowledge on how big is the <laughs> uh the great wall of china and by which metrics because if you google length of great wall of china it comes up as twenty one thousand kilometers which is absurd um um anything you two want to plug uh no no i don't think so Not at this <laughs> stage except of course for my talk on friday at western yes western students uh i'll send out a link to my students because i'm teaching right now so oh, right, there you uh, go. yeah they should act actually they have to design a mission uh well, they have to propose a mission to a fictional prime minister. It's almost <laughs> like I'm making them do my job. Um, uh, Tanya, how about you? Uh, oh, gosh. Oh, actually, yeah. So um, October, <laughs> it's late in my time zone. Um, so October 12th and 13th is the Planet Explorer user conference, and it's free to register. And we have a whole track of science programming this year. So that's Tuesday and Wednesday, October 12th and 13th. So for the Canadians, right after Canadian Thanksgiving. Um, but it should be really cool. We brought together a lot of really awesome researchers, including some some cool Canadians like Dan Sugar out of the University of Calgary, um, talking about the, the different research that they've been doing um, everything from the what we get changes in the arctic to agriculture to monitoring landslides uh, i'm super excited about it so um yeah you can register for free i think it's just explore 2021.planet.com so check it out i didn't know we were doing corporate promotions here Jeez. it's a science promotion also i'm wearing like planet swag so i guess i might wow. as well promote it <laughs> well you know maybe we can use a sponsor um <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to everyone who tuned into the live show if you're still there. And if you're watching this in the archives, thanks for watching. And if you're a student of mine, do the reading. And uh, to everyone else, thanks so much for joining. And we'll see you next month. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.